This is on? Yes, perfect. Uh, as an introductory remark, I completely agree. Wages is important, but it's not on the top. And uh, that's uh, based on the invitation that I got from Eurobill, uh, Mr. Jacob, that's uh, what I was about to, to talk about as well. Uh, I have two points that I would like to address today. Uh, one is the uh, so called demographic challenge that there are changes and reduction in the recruitment base, both in quality and in quantity. These challenges have to be addressed. And these challenges must basically also addressed by, by the former states. Based on the invitation that I got, there is also referring a lot to what I refer to as the strategic challenge for armed forces across uh, Europe. And also, from a Norwegian perspective, we have been here for quite some time since the end of the Cold War. And that is the continued stagnation or decrease in defense budgets. How do you approach these challenges? And I will give you some um, inputs from what uh, we have done at, uh, in Norway. I have been a researcher at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment since 1999. I was the first econ rhetorician that I employed there. Uh, and I've been involved in long-term defense planning ever since for the Norwegian Chief of Defense. So I've been on the inside looking at these perspectives. And the single uh, message I have to say is that long-term defense planning means doing something in a 20, 30, 40 years time, not what the politicians are doing for four year periods, which is an extremely dangerous uh, tilting, so to speak. But I kick off with the demographic challenge. I have been a member of a EDA, I understand that EDA is represented here today, represented today. Uh, working group called the impact of demographic change on recruitment and retention in defense. It was also called and system design, uh, but uh, system design fell out of it because we found way too many challenges to address in this working group. We worked together for nine years. We met two to three times every year. We were quite an international group, but we were quite a small group, so we got to be really good friends and colleagues uh, through this time. And it was really in parallel with national challenges. Um, the demographic changes, which I will address fairly shortly, how would they impact military recruitment, selection process, retention, career management, performance, all these issues that uh, our former speaker just <coughs> addressed. The way we looked at it was uh, to create this international working group we met uh, three times a year, as I mentioned. Uh, Norway, Sweden, as I mentioned uh, also earlier today, Canada of all countries, not even in the country in, in the in Europe, <coughs> but they were very willing to participate. Uh, Belgium, Netherlands and Switzerland. Which, uh, so there's a there's an inter interesting constellation of countries here uh, talking today at Europe. Of course, we kicked off traditionally with the literature studies, and we did a good summary of the independent national surveys that has been done in every country. Every year. <coughs> uh, participated in lots of conferences, uh, and we did two surveys on our own. One we call the Youth Survey, where we basically asked youngsters in these six countries, about 10,000 of them, what do you look for when you are looking for a job? What do you prefer? What do you value? And then we did a so-called expert survey, which basically we sent out to all NATO panels, all EDA panels, uh, all academics at the conferences. Uh, some of the bigger conferences we attended had uh, between 500 and 1,000 experts within HR, personnel studies, and so forth and so forth. And we asked the experts, what do you believe is the core problem? What do you believe? how we should address these uh, challenges, these problems. Now we do a quick summary of these, these things. Demographic change has been addressed already, but in short, all countries will experience increased life expectancy. The median age will increase, uh, and the graph here, what you see here, is that we are getting older and older and healthier and we live longer. That's basically uh, something that we have to address and we have to focus uh, on the time coming up. Your, Europe, as a continent, is actually one of the few places in the world where the population will decline. 
be going into a peak in around 2014, and after that, European population will decline. The number of young people, uh, then I mean by the age of 15 to 24, entering the labor market will diminish by 25% between now and 2015. And the increased unemployment among older people, uh, there will be an increase among older people uh, still able to work. There's also an increase in urbanization, which means that the, uh, the challenges uh, laying ahead internally for the armed forces is going to be more complex. Um, and, and we are getting more and more diverse. So you guys sitting here are not the same diversity we're going to see in Europe in 30, 40 years time, so to speak. And this diversity is going to accelerate because there are differences in fertility rates due to migration. So the migrants are giving birth to way more children than what we native Europeans, what the heck that is, uh, are doing. And this is, uh, in short, a, a short summary of the demographic changes that the armed forces have tried to sort of address on short term and on long term. <coughs> so what we did was sort of try to sum it up. And this is one pager based on nine years of work, and of course I will say more during the, during the, um, the uh, discussion we're going to have. But in short, the Armed Forces Europe will face an ever-shrinking native male labor force, and it's also an increasing reliance on gender balance and working age immigrants. That's just uh, something that we have to sort of take into consideration to a greater and greater extent. And the young population itself is changing. Also, done with this little sort of uh, humoristic uh, uh, way to do it. Uh, this is something that we see in Norway all the time. The youngsters have a lot of requirements when they apply for a job. So, in this case, for instance, my, uh, my client is ready to enlist, but he wants full creativity control. This is something that we actually see today in the armed forces of Norway. They want short working weeks, no staying awake at night. No commuting, free choice of uniform, something that the youngsters have at page 17. Private office, all media rights to its own story, to write the book later on, and 10% of unused defense funding. You know, this is uh, something unheard of uh, so when I entered the armed forces in 1980. We even think uh, around these terms. I was young, naive, had no idea what I entered when I started the infantry. And, uh, I'm not sure what that is either at the end. <coughs> Another change here we see is that there are in the future less people with high school with um, with high school degree or less, which basically means that they're taking more and more education. And traditionally, those with a higher level of education they find the armed forces less attractive than those with less education. There is an increase in overweight or obese. And there's a chronic lack of physical activity, especially in Norway, where the numbers I know best. But also, according to my European colleagues, we are getting in worse and worse shape overall. And we're getting more in two categories. Those who are in extremely good shapes, doing all sorts of strange physical extreme activities, and those who are just sitting on the sofa and looking at TV. So we're getting more binary. The, the overall activity, just walking to work and stuff, is or a stimulation. Young people tend to put more emphasis on self-fulfillment, the job, individual freedom, quality of life, which again is not aligned with the uh, with the uh, subordination, so to speak, and being part of something bigger than yourself. That is something that the armed force traditionally has valued, and that is something that I have to face as a concentration in the future. And that is something directly opposite of what we are requiring. The nature of future conflicts are likely to follow from demographic pressures, especially when it comes to lack of water, difference in income, the conflicts are going, most likely going to be in the urban cities. Uh, working in an urban environment is a whole new uh, criteria for, uh, for the young forces to work in, and, uh, which requires a lot of knowledge among the young soldiers, which we see is hard. And independent changes, and in, so each nation uh, have different challenges, each regions have different challenges, 
For Norway, we are more and more talking about state actors and terrorists. Other countries are very much concerned about non state actors and terrorists. Both countries have facing limited to both, but we tend to <coughs> align towards one or the other, which means that we get more fragmented in our overall strategy, which is tough. He mentioned that salary is way down on the list. We find the same thing. This is the question that we asked uh, uh, youngsters between the age of 18 and 25 in the six nations in question. And we see that uh, good work atmosphere is on the top, job security, job security stimulating work environment, work life balance, everything that he mentioned is basically proven in our survey uh, that we done a few years ago. Salary is up there, and it's not using important but rather important. So it's basically a proof of <laughs> what they said. It's part of the overall consideration, but it's not the most important thing. Now we ask the experts, what is useful to face demographic changes? Wages is in there, but it's way down on the list. And the experts are all agreeing about one thing, is that we have to take into consideration a great, great deal of diversity in the future, more women in the, in, into the armed forces, more um, uh, migrants, or call what you like. Most nations um, still require a citizenship, but some nations are starting to lose this up a little bit. They require, they can approve it from neighboring countries to a certain degree and so forth. When that is being uh, said in Norway, forget it. It's, you have to be in a region, you have to be in a region board. Uh, and so forth. So it's really strict, uh, which is going to be a good, hard challenge in the future. Uh, yes. It's on time for discussion. The final thing I want to say, coming from uh, the work of uh, Norway on long term defense planning, when budgets are stagnating um, or falling, what we have seen in the Norwegian economy is that. There's a very strong correlation between wages in, in the Norwegian workforce at all and the, the, the change in wages in the armed forces. It's not like the armed forces has the ability to live all by himself. It has to follow one way or the other. The main reason for this is strong unions. Okay? So the wage growth is more or less following it's, it's, uh, the same pace of the society as a whole. The big difference between the wages in the defense of Norway and uh, other uh, areas of the Norwegian sector is the activity compensation that the Norwegian officers and soldiers have been given. It's a really high activity based compensation. Almost 50% of the income for a regular soldier comes from the activity that they are doing. And the Norwegian MOD is, is uh, staring or is uh, continually telling everyone in our forces that you, in order to succeed on the missions that we are telling you to do, you need to have at least 55 days of activity per year, which means staying out in a tent, being away from the family, blah, 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 and so forth and so forth. And coming from that sort of number, you basically are giving a really high wage. So the average wage for a young Norwegian working in the military today is higher, is actually much higher than anyone else on the same age group. They are wage leaders in Norway. And that is unique in Europe. Okay? Because they are also being paid freely education at the end of the day. So what we are seeing over time is that the operating costs, what we call them, they are growing independently. So if we are facing a budget that is stagnating or falling, and the operating costs are still increasing, that means that the only effect on the armed forces is their ability to take into new technology and to buy new equipment. So that means that the long-term defense planning has to, has to face this challenge. What you own is getting more and more expensive. What you would like to buy is getting more and more expensive. And the money available is getting less. Which means that you have to transfer the complete organization completely in order to avoid that and scenario here that you basically are only using operating costs in the armed forces, which means you have no flexibility to face new challenges. 
And that's why the wage is really low <laughs> in the armed forces uh, use as well. Uh, they are focusing on new equipment. Oh, that was not more than ten minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much.